If you could uh, turn your attention to Psalm 107, verses 4 through 9, that's where we're going to start today. Thank you, Brother Adon, for helping with the offering. Psalm chapter 107, verses 4 through 9, just so uh, everybody knows. If you're here Wednesdays, you know I really like the New American Standard Bible translation. It's a good one. It's word for word, uh, like the King James, but it's a little bit easier to read. So the New American Standard Bible uh, says this in Psalms 107, verses 4 through 9. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. They were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders <clears throat> to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. <laughs> that is such a cool psalm. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your word. You can all be seated. We're gonna dive into this together. The title that I have for today, kind of a fun one, and I'll explain, uh, just bear with me for a little bit with this title, okay? I'll explain it as we go on. But the title that I really felt to teach on today was the subject of leaky buckets, What a cool graphic too, right? Thank you, Sister Calhoun. That's awesome. It's exactly what I had in mind, actually, which is just incredible. So where we started today uh, is, is a psalm from David. So let me just give you a quick rundown of what we'll be talking about so I don't catch you off guard. We're gonna talk through uh, a little bit of King David's life, especially in the context of Psalms 107. I want to share with you some interesting conversations that I had this week with uh, some people that I'm connected with. And I want to tell you, first off, and I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the point today, and maybe after I say this, we can just close our Bibles and go home. The main point that I want to share with you today is that there is nothing in this world that can fill you up the way the Holy Spirit can. Nothing in this world can fill us up the way the Holy Spirit does. So we start with King David. This psalm, Psalm 107, is believed to have been written while David was on his flight from Saul. Uh, if you've studied the life of David at all, you'll, you'll understand that he was anointed as king at a young age. He got Saul's attention very early in his life with slaying Goliath and for his uh, abilities on musical instruments. Saul uh, essentially adopted King David into his family and had him leave Jesse, his, fa his actual father, and lived in the house of Saul for a long time. And Saul, we know, was uh, a very troubled individual. Um, when you read scripture that describes him, it looks like he dealt with uh, a lot of mental illness. He dealt with a lot of spiritual illness. He dealt with a fractured mind. Um, he wasn't very logical. He was bloodthirsty. He was kind of a crazy guy later in his life. But David, living with Saul, created a, a lot of jealousy within Saul. Saul knew David was anointed as king after him. Saul was troubled. David would come in and play music, play psalms and uh, songs to God to soothe his spirit, but Saul made David's life very, very difficult for a very long time. While David was playing his instruments to soothe Saul, Saul tried to kill him a handful of times until eventually Saul was, was genuinely trying to kill David and was pursuing him all over the countryside David was living in caves, he had his mighty men, he had military experience, but Saul was making his life very, very troubled. So when you look at that period of David's life, 
He was going through problem after problem, going from city to city, not knowing where his next meal was going to be, not knowing if Saul was going to catch up to him and kill him in his sleep. Like that, that's a very hard way to live. Very hard way to live. And some of the Psalms that you read are written from that place in David's life where he's writing about, Lord, I don't know what to do with my next step. Lord, you're going to have to take care of my enemies for me. Fight my battles for me because because I'm, I'm hurting and I'm in pain and I don't know where my next meal is coming from. That's a lot of uh, David's Psalms come from that place, which makes a lot of sense when you read his very emotional Psalms like this one. I'm going to read it to you one more time because I think it captures how we all feel walking through this life. Before I get there, can we all agree on something? Can we all agree that living on this side of eternity can be very difficult at times? <laughs> Got a couple witnesses in the house. Living on this side of eternity. My great-grandma used to say, I don't know how people survive without Jesus. Really? So let me read this and think about this again. Meditate on it from the life of David that I've just explained, very difficult, very hard being pursued, not knowing where his next meal is coming from, so on and so forth, just a hard life. They wandered in the wilderness in a desert region. They did not find a way to an inhabited city. So number one, isolated. No one else is around. How many of you have felt that before? Nobody knows what I'm dealing with. Nobody's dealt with what I'm dealing with. I'm all alone. Verse five, they were hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them, starving for something, but not being able to find it. Especially in our soul, hungry and thirsty for satisfaction, for peace, but it's nowhere to be found. And it's at that point that the person or the people that David is writing about or the story he's trying to tell, it's at that point, the point of isolation, the point of starvation, and the point of, of dehydration that they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And then what did God do? He delivered them out of their distresses. He led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city. So notice that God met every need. He took them to a place of belonging, a place of family and connection, an inhabited city. And he, let, uh, he led them to go to an inhabited city. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. Man, I... The, the things that were already said today about God's loving kindness, his faithfulness, his goodness, that is the God that we serve. That when we do go through these periods of life, all we have to do is one thing. Lord, help me. Lord, I need you. Jesus, show up in my life right now. And he's as close as the mention of his name. It's a good God that we serve. This week, I had conversations with four separate people, and I'm going to tell you their stories really quickly, and then I want to share with you some things that I learned today, this week. I met with someone who is a believer, but he was sharing with me the pressure that he feels in life. Now, I work with this individual, but he was sharing with me the financial struggles of him working and still at fairly an entry-level position, his wife trying to stay home with their child, and the financial burden that comes with that. It, nowadays, if, if you are a family that is able to have someone work and someone stay home with the children, I want you to recognize that you are blessed. Many families don't have that that blessing in their life. 
And that's something that this, this, my coworker was sharing with me is that, yes, they want, they, they agreed that they want the wife to stay home and, and help with the children and be at home and homeschool. And they have all of these visions and plans for their family, but still work the job, the finances just aren't working out. And there's so much pressure to perform at work and then so much pressure to go home and be a dad and be a husband. And then the, the frustration of like, needing to grow your career so you make more money, so your family can be okay, that frustration when it doesn't happen the way you want it to or when you have setbacks and when you have trouble. And he was just kind of pouring his heart out to me. And I I asked him a question. I said, I won't say his name. I was about to say his name. I won't say his name. I said, can you tell me what's the most important thing in life? And he's a believer. And he said that I know Jesus. And I responded with empathizing. Like, I understand how that feels. I've been there. But if we can get a hold of Jesus, it doesn't matter what happens on this side of eternity because we have the beginning to look forward to. Because death is not the end, brothers and sisters. Death is the beginning of something new. I met with another individual that's in Texas, and I volunteer with an organization that helps military personnel transition into the civilian life because that's, that's hard. And I meet with this individual on a monthly basis and she was sharing with me that she's going through a really messy divorce right now. She's got three kids. The, the problems that they've been having have just multiplied and gotten worse and now they're in the process of separating but it, it's so much stress because she's still in school. She's trying to find a job and she's trying to support her three daughters. They all live with her. You talk about a tough life. And as we were talking, she kind of just opened up to me a little bit. And I said, before we get any further, I want you to know something, that I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Christian, I'm a licensed pastor, and she, her response was, oh my goodness, I have been going back to church since February. And I know, this is what she said, I know it's not an accident that God put us together. So we had a heart to heart and just sharing with her that, that if you hold on to God, it doesn't always mean that our life is fixed like that. It doesn't always mean that the trouble goes away. It doesn't always mean that we won't struggle financially. We won't have issues in relationships. It doesn't mean that at all. But rather what it means is when we hold on to Jesus, he starts changing us. At the same time, he walks through the fire with us. I met with another person, this was on Friday, who lost their sister suddenly. They, they all work for the same bank that I work for, so I knew the family. And I, I got a chance to meet this person um, for the first time in person on Friday. And we were talking, and, I, and she came up to me and just gave me a big hug. Because and, and, we've been talking back and forth, you know, at work through emails and stuff. Gave me a big hug and just said, like, thank you so much for being there. But I, I got, she told me the story. Her sister went home from work sick, sick on a Friday, just a major migraine, throwing up, like all kinds of stuff, went home. They have a, a five-year-old daughter, and she was at home on Saturday and still had the headache, and the daughter came and said, like, Mom, are you doing okay? Mom's like, no, I'm going to go to sleep, and she never woke up. She had a brain aneurysm and just died. And I like my heart just goes out to that family. If you've ever suffered a loss, especially a sudden loss like that, it's unimaginable pain. At the same time, I, had a sim- I was able to have a similar conversation with her and say, look, I, I don't know what that feels like. I really don't. But I know somebody. I know somebody who can help. And I got to share with her a, a little bit about how I've been praying for her and, you know, just how God is there for her. And, and thankfully, like, it, it didn't end. It opened the door for more conversations that we're going to be having 
in the future, but, but, but my heart just goes out to that. And then just yesterday, I met with a friend, friends of mine who actually, they told me to tell you all, thank you for your support. Sarah and Josh Kurtsetter, they're friends of ours. Sarah just gave, essentially gave birth to a 20-week baby that did not survive. This was a month ago, is that right? About a month, two months ago? Oh, two weeks ago? Oh, geez, I didn't know it was that soon. But, but we got a chance to talk with them. And then in the midst of that, I know this is a bum session for a second, okay? Like, there, there's a reason why I'm telling you all of this. But in the midst of all of that, Josh lost his job while they're dealing with all of this. But we went over to their house and gave them a meal and gave them the card that so many of you signed, and thank you so much for that. They told me to tell you all publicly thank you. They appreciate the prayers, and he started tearing up when I was sharing with him that, you know, it's, it's, we're here for you, right? Our church family is there for you. Jesus is there for you. And he, he even said to me, he said, you know, if somebody would have told me a couple months ago I'm praying for you, I would have thought that's a nice gesture. But he said, God has changed my mind on prayer. And he said, now I feel the prayers of others that are ministering to my soul. That's what Josh said to me. So thank you so much for praying for that family because they need it. I tell all of you to illustrate, I, I tell all of you these stories to illustrate a point. Whether we're talking about David or we're talking about other regular people that we bump into every day, people are going through some of the hardest challenges they have ever faced in their life. And we may never know that. The common theme here is that life on this side of eternity is very difficult, and I really don't understand how people make it without Jesus. I don't understand it because so much happens on this side of eternity because we live in a broken world and there's sin that's in this world and people make bad decisions and so on and so forth. And then stuff just happens because of the broken world and the broken life that we live. Stuff just happens. And I don't understand how people can stay sane through all of that. Because this is something, this is a scripture that kept coming to my mind when people were talking, when they were sharing with me these stories and they were sharing with me some of the things that they're trying to do to like feel better and the books they're reading, podcasts they're listening to, um, trying to fill it with entertainment or social circles or families, this thought kept coming to my mind. And it's, uh, the, has anybody heard uh, of this statement? It's called the human condition. Has anybody heard of this? Okay, so there, this is a, I'm gonna take you on a philosophical journey for a second and then we're gonna connect it to the Bible, okay? So the human condition is, a, is recognizing that all of humans struggle with some very core basic issues. We all struggle and we strive to be satisfied. We strive for peace, but we also recognize that we go through very difficult things in our life and that messes with our desire for peace and for contentment. The human condition it's basically dealing with our flesh. If you could boil it down to Bible terms, it's dealing with the fleshly side of us and all of the pain and trouble that comes with that. But this scripture kept coming to my mind because in those, not all four of those conversations, but some of them, it kept jumping out to me that they were trying and looking for some kind of something to soothe their soul, but it wasn't necessarily Jesus. They were either looking for more money or looking for career satisfaction or reading books and podcasts, and none of that stuff is necessarily bad, but when we start seeking those things rather than seeking God, it makes us feel like a bucket with holes in it. And this scripture kept coming to my mind. It was Ecclesiastes 1 and 2. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Everything on this earth that we try to soothe our souls with, every coping mechanism that we develop in our own mind, every thing that we try to do to make ourselves happy or have peace, it's all vanity. Everybody understands what vanity means, right? It doesn't mean like I'm vain in the sense that I think very highly of myself. 
No, Ecclesiastes, the writer of Ecclesiastes, the way he is using it, is uh, it literally translates, emptiness of emptiness, all is empty. When he looks at all of the works of his hands, and this is traditionally believed to have been written by Solomon, there's no 100% verification, but it's believed that. And that makes a lot of sense because you have the writer of Ecclesiastes looking at all the works of his hands, all of the finances that he has built, all of the, his big family, all the work that he has done, and he looks at it all and says, emptiness of emptiness. It's all empty. There is no satisfaction in this world. There's nothing that can meet the hunger and thirst of our soul. And this is a common frustration that humans have is that desire to find satisfaction and peace in life when the life is full of trouble. And the image that came to my mind was exactly this. (laughs) It was exactly this. It was a picture of a bucket that had holes all in the bottom of it. And the the point that I want to get across to you is this. I'm going to use this as an illustration. I debated whether or not to bring a bucket with holes in it. (laughs) I almost did. That would have made Pastor really happy. Almost did. Almost did. Um, The leaky bucket. look, Look at ourselves when we're just in this world existing. I'm going to get to our life before Christ and then after Christ, okay? So this illustration for the purposes of right now is we are a bucket with holes in it before Jesus. We try to pour stuff into our life over and over and over again, but somehow we're left empty and dry on the inside. It doesn't matter how much water you put in this bucket. It will continue to be empty. It's going to continue to empty out because the way that our life works is, you know, maybe we do something really cool. We get a couple pats on the back. So we get a little water poured into our bucket. We feel good for a little bit. And then nothing else is, nothing is coming into our life consistently. So then before long, we're like, man, I just don't feel I don't feel good. And we start to look at our life and everything just feels empty and dry. And then we deal with that for a little while. And then maybe, you know, uh, something good happens and a little bit of water goes back in the bucket. But then sooner or later, all that water drains back out and we're left empty again. And it's this constant search to try to fill our bucket or fill our life when we leak all over the place. And that's what... Ecclesiastes 1 and 2 is really pointing us towards is that whatever you're filling your bucket with on this earth, it will not satisfy. Eventually, you'll be left empty and dry and nothing left. And we just feel like we're just these walking husks of flesh. Has anybody felt that before? There's a great scripture in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13 that really drives this point home. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13, let me give you a little explanation before we get there. Uh, How many of you have read the book of Jeremiah? A lot of people, okay. He's a prophet in the Old Testament. He was a a prophet that was called to a wicked nation. Man, the, the children of Israel were not living good when Jeremiah was alive. He had trouble after trouble in his life. People wanted to kill him. They tried to exile him. They tried to throw him in a pit. They tried to do all this stuff because he was calling for repentance in the people of God, and they didn't want to repent. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, listen to what God says about the people. For my people have committed two evils. Number one, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Where else do you see that in the Bible? Jesus teaches about that, and we'll get there in a minute. But God says, the first evil is they have forsaken me. I'm the fountain of living water. That's what God says. The second thing that the people did is they hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. You talk about a leaky bucket. 
A cistern is designed to hold water. But what God is saying is when the people have walked away from me or when they disregard me, the only thing they can create is leaky buckets. That's it. We can only create broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Because we're imperfect. We don't have the ability to satisfy ourselves. I don't have the ability to give you peace or satisfaction in your life. You don't have the ability to give that to me. No human on this earth has that ability. And that's what God is saying, that when we stay connected to him, those are the cisterns that hold water. Those are the buckets that fill up when we stay connected to God. The things of this world cannot satisfy us. One thing that one of the conversations I had, one thing was said, and it stuck with me, and it's still rolling around in my head. The person that I'm talking to from Texas, she said this. She said, Reese, just recently, I deleted, now I'm not asking you to do this, okay? But she said, I deleted social media from my life completely. Got off of all of it. This is what she said, and I quote, I stopped looking for other people to validate my life because I realized that it wasn't satisfying what my heart needed. <laughs> you talk about a profound realization. Validation and praise from others cannot keep us full when life gets hard. The success of yesterday, you might ride a high for a little while, but life has a great, uh, you can always count on life for something. That something chaotic is going to happen. <laughs> that really, when you're, when you're not looking at it from a spirituality lens, when you're just looking at this earth for what it is, that is the number one constant on this earth is that chaos is going to happen and change will happen. And I'll be honest with you, I've been dealing with this in my own life, in, in my own workplace, frustrated and, and things that worked in the past not working now and successes that I've had not having now and really feeling like, like I don't know what's happening. But that's the thing you can count on in this world is change and chaos. So we can only ride those highs for so long until life just catches up with us. Solomon even wrote this in Proverbs, Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. If we're so worried about the validation of others, all that is, the word for snare, you can replace that with a trap. It's a trap. That's it. Seeking for other people to validate our way of life or seeking for other people to confirm what we want or what we desire and make us feel good is a trap from the enemy. And it's a trap in this world because the only thing that that does is it creates a vicious cycle where we get our bucket full for a moment, but we never address the holes and we're not filling it with the right stuff. Our bucket's full for a moment and then we're left empty again. And then we have to seek that validation, that approval all over again. And maybe it'll come, maybe it won't. So the fear of man or worrying about what people think of us is a trap. But... He who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. He who trusts in the Lord will live a life above the trap of this world. He who trusts in the Lord will live a life above the sin and muck and garbage that's here in this earth. That's the life that I want to live. You know what's amazing about God? Is that even though... We're a bunch of leaky buckets that really have no value because what is the value of a bucket? The fact that it can hold water. <laughs> but when we're trying to live this life on our own and we're building these broken cisterns and we're dealing with this leaky bucket, there's really no value. But the amazing thing about God is that he doesn't leave us like that. He might find us like that or we might come to him looking like that. Maybe your holes are some bullet holes. I don't know. Maybe it's rust that just life wearing on us. You know, I don't know what the holes are because we're all broken before Jesus. We're all broken. 
We came into this world broken, and if we don't turn our life over to God, we leave this world broken. What did David say? That all humans are born and shapen in iniquity. And what does iniquity do? Iniquity destroys and it breaks down. That's what sin does. So by understanding that, we know we come into this world broken, but all of us might be broken in different ways. Maybe the holes that we're dealing with, maybe it is rust because life just wears on us over and over again, like rust on ox, like oxidizing metal. It's just constant exposure after exposure that eventually just eats away at what's there. Or maybe it is uh, holes that came from a painful relationship or abuse or loss. The thing that's amazing about God is that it doesn't matter what the brokenness is. He fixes broken things. He fixes the brokenness. Psalm chapter 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 147 and 3. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. That's the kind of God that we serve. So just as a bucket with holes in it can't hold any water for very long, our brokenness prevents us from being truly satisfied on this earth. Like I mentioned, we're all naturally broken due to our sin nature, but I am so thankful that in God's loving kindness, he repairs the brokenness in our life. Just like I read to you, he fixes the broken heart, he binds up wounds, he heals, not just physically healing, and I believe that God does that. God heals people miraculously in their body. God also heals people miraculously in their mind and in their heart. Because there's a lot of brokenness and a lot of pain and a lot of sickness of the spirit and of the mind. Just look at Saul's life. He was physically in perfect condition, but he had a sickness of the spirit and of the mind that fractured the way that he looked at himself and the way he looked at others. I 100% believe that if Saul would have turned back to God, God could have healed him in a moment and made him to be a great king. I 100% believe that. But because he didn't turn to God, he kept building broken cisterns in his life that could not hold satisfaction and peace and that drove him to be bloodthirsty and jealous and envious. But then when you look at a king like Manasseh, Manasseh, a broken man, I mean wicked. The Bible said he was the worst king that ever lived. He filled the streets with the blood of the prophets. He murdered people. He did everything he wanted to do, but he was led into captivity. The difference between Manasseh and Saul, Manasseh repented. Manasseh repented. He turned to God, and what did God do? God made his reign one of the longest in the list of kings because he turned back to God and he stopped building the broken cisterns and stopped living like a leaky bucket, allowed God to fix his brokenness in his spirit and in his mind and allowed God to fill him up to overflow. God can do that for anyone. It doesn't matter what the brokenness is. God is in the business of fixing brokenness. So man, sometimes the way God fixes it is different. Maybe he throws some duct tape on there that lasts forever. Have y'all ever seen the Flex Seal commercials? <laughs> they drill a big old hole and he slaps that Flex Seal on there and it stops leaking. Maybe God welds it back together. Maybe God gives you a new bucket. I don't know. The way God fixes the brokenness, it looks different in everybody's life. The fact is, he fixes it so that we can hold something. Psalm chapter 107 and 9, this was the opening text, but I want to read specifically verse 9 again. For he has satisfied the thirsty soul, and the hungry soul he has filled with what is good. I want to connect that scripture to the teachings of Jesus. 
John chapter four, verses 13 through 14. Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will, will thirst again. It's talking about the well. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That sounds so different from the way humanity is described without Jesus. Remember what we've already covered. David writes in 107, uh, we're wandering around, we're isolated, we're hungry and thirsty. Remember what God said about the people in Jeremiah chapter 2. They've turned away from me and they, br they build broken cisterns that can't hold water. And then listen to what God is saying to his people. In Jeremiah, he says, I am the well of living water. God speaks to David. David writes, God is the one who satisfies our thirst and he fills us when we're hungry. And then we see Jesus teaching right here. Earthly water benefits you for a little while. You get to stay alive for a little longer. But the spiritual water, the well of living water, when you drink from that, now, all of a sudden, it's a continuous flow in your life. He creates a well of living water inside of us. It's his Holy Spirit that flows and flows and flows. So God fixes the brokenness. Remember the illustration with the leaky bucket. Trying to find satisfaction on this earth is like that inconsistent flow. We get a little bit here and there. Somebody says, hey, good job. A little bit goes in our tank. Oh, it feels good, but it don't last long because it's leaking out. So the first thing God does is fix the bucket, fixes the brokenness. Then he addresses the flow. He fixes the brokenness so the bucket can hold the water. And then he changes what is being poured into our life. It's no longer other people's validation, bank account feeling good, I'm healthy, I'm this, I'm that. It's no longer that. Now it's the Holy Spirit pouring water into our soul. And let me tell you this about the Holy Spirit. You, if you're filled with the Spirit, you can attest to this. That flow doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. When we look for things in the world, it's a little bit here, a little bit there. When you're living for God and you're living in the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit as Galatians and Ephesians teaches us, that faucet is on. And it is filling and filling and filling. It doesn't turn off when you're living for the Lord. This is the amazing thing about this illustration. Right here, water, would you agree that water is flowing? It's going in and out. Right? We're all on the same page there. It's going in and out. When you're living for the Lord, water is flowing too. But here's the difference. It's not just going in and out. He fixes the holes, fills it up until it comes out the top and it keeps coming out. That is the well of living water that God gives us. That is how he pours into our spirit and it doesn't stop. The water is still flowing, but here's the difference. Our bucket is full and at the same time, there's more than enough for everyone around us. He fills us up to, what does it say? To overflow. Right, and now all of a sudden that bucket is satisfying our soul while also being poured into somebody else's bucket. We can say, hey, I got more than enough. Let me minister to you here. Let me talk to you here. Let me help you meet this need. Let me be Jesus to you. Man, that is the powerful thing of this illustration. The water is still flowing, but now we're so full that we have the ability to minister to everyone around us and everyone gets to benefit from that water, the water that Jesus gives us. Listen to this, John chapter seven, verse 37 and 38. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being, or out of your belly, if you're reading King James, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Now, what does that sound like to you? 
That sounds like satisfaction to the soul and then benefit to everyone around that person. Rivers of living water. Now the human being, the bucket, has become a conduit to meet the needs of other buckets around us. Now that bucket has become the conduit to pour into other people's lives. We may be the only Jesus that somebody sees. We may be the only example of scriptural living that somebody comes in contact with. And that's the kind of water that every human being needs is that water, the living water, the water from cisterns that don't leak, the water that springs forth out of our life. John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. I'm about to wrap up. John chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let me tell you something about abundant life. Abundant life is meant to be shared. Abundant life is meant to be shared with everyone around us. It is not just for us. It's not just our one-way ticket to heaven and now I'm good. The abundant life that we live in brings forth the fruit of the Spirit. It's the living water that flows out of our belly. And those things are for the benefit of those around us. Those things are to minister to broken people around us and to lead them to the one who can fix the bucket and fill them up to overflowing. And see, now it becomes a multiplication effect. It's exponential growth now because I'm not just concerned about me making it to heaven, but now God has fixed my bucket and God has filled my bucket and now it's overflowing so I can minister to the next person. And then when that person has that same experience and God fixes their bucket and fills them up, now they can overflow into the next person. And now you've created exponential growth in the kingdom of heaven. Because if everybody is doing that, that's like multiplying by two every single time. Eventually the number gets wild. It might start out small. Maybe today there's somebody here and you're feeling like you just need your bucket fixed. Can I tell you that God is here to do that right now? And maybe you're here and you've started to experience God and and he has fixed some things in your life, but you're still feeling empty. Can I tell you right now that he is here today to fill you up with living water? And then for those of us that maybe we feel like our buckets are I wouldn't say fixed. I don't think we ever arrive. You know, I'm not saying we get perfect, but, but we're walking with the Lord. God has ministered to us and God has changed our heart and fixed a lot of things and, and we're full of the Holy Spirit and we're overflowing. Can I tell you, if that's you today, then that means that God has somebody you need to pour into. Someone in your life that needs even just a sip of that living water because even a sip of living water turns into a fountain of living water on the inside. Can we all stand? This is where I'm gonna wrap up. Connecting all this back to Psalm 107. Many of us know what it feels like to live in isolation Many of us know what it feels like to be hungry and thirsty for satisfaction and peace and not finding it. Maybe somebody here is going through the hardest thing they've ever gone through in their life. I don't know. But remember what David wrote in Psalm 107. When the people turned to God, God met every single one of the needs. He led them to an inhabited city. He led them to community, to connection. No longer isolated, but now connected to something, to somebody. He fed them with things that are good, things that satisfy the spiritual hunger. And he gave them drink that satisfied the spiritual thirst. 
So the people in Psalm 107.4 are much different than the people in Psalm 107.9. Psalm 107.4, alone, alone, starving, and dehydrated. Psalm 107.9, connected, full, and thirst quenched. What is the difference between those two people or those two groups of people? God, he is the difference maker. He is the only one that can fix the bucket and fill it up to overflow. The only one. Can we all close our eyes and bow our heads for a second? Like I mentioned, I don't know what uh, you may be facing today. I don't know where you see yourself and what we've talked about, whether you're the isolated, hungry, and thirsty person or you're the person that has a leaky bucket or you're feeling dry and whatever on the inside or maybe you're the person living in the overflow. I don't know. But I would just ask that we all examine where we are. Think about what we've talked about today. Where do you see yourself in this sermon? And then I would challenge each one of us, myself included, wherever you find yourself in this sermon that was talked about today, take the appropriate action that we've discussed. If you feel isolated, dry, hungry, I invite you to this altar. Lift your hands and turn to the Lord because he can connect you and fill you up. If you feel like a leaky bucket today, come to this altar, lift your hands and turn to the Lord because he can fix the leaks. If you feel dry, like maybe things are going okay, but you're feeling kind of dry, come to this altar, lift your hands, turn to the Lord because he can fill you up again. And if you're living in the overflow, Come to this altar, lift your hands, turn to the Lord and let him guide you to who you are supposed to pour into. In short, this altar call is for everybody. So I would invite everybody to come down to the front today. Because whatever you need, he is here for you. One of the coolest ways that God ever described himself was to Moses in the burning bush. I am that I am. Jesus even used that, that title to show that he is God incarnate. But what that means today is he is exactly what you need right now. And he is here to fix the brokenness and fill you up to overflowing. In Jesus' name. Fill me up, God. 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 Fill me